Hello again, and welcome back to Professional Insights, brought to you in part by the National Referral Network, where these conversations are purposely driven for you to elevate the conversations that you should be asking the professionals that you are working with. And today we have Rod Hatley from the Hatley Law Group. Uh, we're going to talk about just estate planning in general. What questions should you be asking? What should you be looking out for? And why should you be? Why should you even have an estate plan? So, Rod, thank you for being here. Certainly appreciate the time. Michael, it's a pleasure to be with you, sir. And so, Rod, in our conversations, um, I want to start off with a, a question that we typically don't ask, mm -hmm. um, but you have a very, very unique story that I think really ties you to a lot of the families that you work with. And so, very simple question: What inspired you to specialize in estate planning? Great question. Um, I'm a former Navy JAG, so if you ever saw the movie A Few Good Men, that's what I used to do years ago. And what happened was, while I was on active duty, my father, uh, who had uh, been a successful businessman, um, passed away. Dad had leukemia, and I knew enough about estate planning in the Navy to be dangerous. And I at least knew enough, though, to know that Dad needed to do more and better planning because all he had was a simple will. And uh, given his complicated estate, he needed more than that. So a trust and various other uh, entities might have been really helpful. Long story short, uh, he passed away. I took two weeks emergency leave. I went back to my hometown of Memphis. Uh, week number one, we got him buried. Week number two, we opened up a probate and that stretched into a seven year ordeal wow. for my sister and me. And that's not what dad would have wanted but that was the practical result of his inability to do more and better planning. And you can certainly understand why. Absolutely. So, Rod, for some people, I believe that everyone should have an estate plan. Okay. I mean, I just, it's some things that you should have. Sure. How would you explain the importance of an estate plan to someone that's unfamiliar with that concept? Well, essentially, uh, if you don't have any planning in place, you're really inviting this, you know, your state. Here, I, I live in practice in California. So, you know, you're inviting the state of California or wherever you live to be the one to determine who gets your stuff and when they get it. Let me ask this question. It's a rhetorical question, of course. Uh, how many financially responsible 18 year olds do you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly wasn't one and I don't think there are a lot of them. But in any event, um, should an 18 year old be getting access to a lot of money? Probably not. Uh, but there's a way to get out ahead of this and say, you know, when when something happens to me, uh, and so that you know, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I've done my own estate plan. If something happened to me, if I'm incapacitated mentally, there won't have to be a conservatorship, which is basically a guardianship for a grown person. And here in California, at least, that takes place in the probate court. And then, of course, uh, if I am out of the picture forever, if I've done no planning, then uh, my estate would have to be probated because I own a home here in California. And, have various other assets too. So that would all have to go through probate because I've done no planning. Or if I had a will, that will guarantee that I will have to go through probate. So uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And if you leave it to chance, uh, the results may not be what you would want them to be. Now, I understand, Rod, that there is a, for, to go through probate in California. Now, every state's different. Sure. But in California, my understanding is that there's a cost to go through probate and it's not cheap. Is that accurate? And what is that cost? Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a really simple example. Um, in California, there's a statutory fee that attorneys can charge uh, simply for the process of, you know, filing paperwork uh, through the court, shepherding that through the probate process. But I'll give you the example. Let's say that you owned a home worth a million dollars, fair market value, not unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't care what your equity value. You might just have a dollar of equity in that home. What, we con what we're concerned about is the fair market value. So that million dollar home, the statutory probate attorney's fee would be $23,000. And the personal representative uh, is entitled to a like fee. So $46,000 on a $1 million uh, fair market value home. And so call it 5%. Uh, of your estate is going out to pay the attorney and the personal representative. 
uh, there's a much smarter and better way to do that. But some people don't ever get there for a variety of reasons. But for those who are able to take action, I encourage them, please do so, because otherwise uh, you're going to make some probate attorney very happy someday. So, and this is this is what I love about these interviews, Rod, is that, so, so let me get this straight. So you could spend three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 on an estate plan. And I understand that prices sure. vary based off the sure. complexity of an estate. Right. So you can, let's just say 5,000, mm -hmm. okay? You could spend 5,000 on an estate plan mm -hmm. that would significantly reduce, if not eliminate going to probate, or mm -hmm. you could spend 46,000 going through probate. Sure. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. You got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So spending 5,000 is way better than spending 46 for you, for, you that, for you that are listening. Just want to point out the obvious here. Yeah. Um, but but to get this thing together, Rod, can you walk us through, and I know this is, is different for each individual based off of complexities, but at a high level, walk us through the typical process of creating an estate plan with a client. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically, uh, first of all, you need to locate an attorney. And ideally, this is someone who spends a lot of his or her time uh, doing estate planning. I mean, you really want to avoid someone who kind of has a door practice and basically whatever walks through the door, that's what they work on. Um, it's always a great idea, you know, and you can find uh, either through friends, family, you can Google it on the internet. Uh, I belong to a national group of about 16,000 estate planning attorneys across the country. Uh, and so people, you can easily find a, uh, a reputable estate planning attorney. What he or she will do is schedule a complimentary in my practice, I do a 15 minute uh, breakthrough call just to find out, are we even a good fit to work together? And if we are, then I'll talk about the next steps and what the investments are for them. Typically, uh, an attorney will meet with you to do what's called a design meeting. And mm -hmm. they'll spend time with you to understand your hopes, fears, dreams, and aspirations. And together, you'll create a plan that really works for you. And when I say work, I mean, it accomplishes uh, or addresses the concerns that you have. What's keeping you up at night? What concerns do you have about your family? Maybe we've got a special needs beneficiary, or maybe uh, we've got someone who's unfortunately maybe has a substance abuse problem. We want to make sure that that person doesn't get money out right after you're gone and drink himself to death or herself or whatever the case might be. And uh, then, um, you know, once you hire the attorney, he or she will draft the plan. And then you'll come back in to see the attorney and then you'll the attorney will conduct what's called a signing ceremony where all the documents will be executed and then they'll be scanned in and the portfolio is assembled and then it's uh, either shipped out to the client either by fedex or ups or usps and or the client can come into the office and pick it up in, in our practice uh, we have a nice tote bag for them and we also include a trustee a successor trustee manual so that when someone is disabled or has passed on, uh, this is a nice owner's manual of what to do next. You know, and usually it's called the attorney, but if they don't want to come back to me or whatever, or maybe mom and dad are now out of the picture and now the kids are trying to figure out what to do, they can come back to me. I hope they will, but they don't have to. But at least we've given them some uh, instructions on what to do next and they can hire whomever they like. And ideally, that'll be somebody who is experienced with uh, trust administration. You mentioned a couple of things in there, you know, sp special needs. Mm -hmm. You don't want somebody to go off and off the rails. Right. Um, what other legal and financial considerations should somebody be considering when sitting down with an attorney to draft an estate plan? Okay. I'm not really sure, Michael. Can you be a little, little bit more specific, uh, for example? Yeah. <clears throat> so for an example, um, I've got four rental properties, okay. right? There, there's the financial considerations, but there's also legal considerations sure. yeah. of how the structures, how the entities are structured that house those. Right. So, it, like in a situation like that, um, what should somebody be talk, telling you, yeah. or the, plan, the planner that they're working with to make sure that those are passed on correctly? Sure. And the financial, whatever those are, right? How do we minimize taxes? So. Right. How, how, how are those taken into account when establishing a state plan? Sure. Uh, great question. So let's say that you've got uh, four rental properties and ideally they're not owned in your individual name because that's a liability mm -hmm. <laughs> waiting right. to happen. So 
if 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 you own them individually, we would obviously recommend. You know, we, we want to build a firewall of protection around each of those entities, each of those rental properties. So a great answer would be to establish a limited liability company so that, you know, if there's a slip and fall, lead paint poisoning, asbestos, whatever, um, they can't reach your personal assets. All they can get is what's in that LLC. Okay, so you've segregated the risk. And then once um, the LLC is established, or maybe perhaps you've already got an LLC established, if you do, terrific, you go to the head of the class. We want to transfer the membership interests of that LLC into the living trust mm-hmm. so gotcha. those never have to go through probate or conservatorship if there's an incapacity. Uh, but we want to always make sure that those assets are at least owned by uh, the living trust because that's going to give you uh, the best protection, um, at least administratively. You know, so you don't have to go through that probate nonsense and you can just your successor trustee will then, you know, either sell the asset or continue to monitor, especially if there's a surviving spouse or children and uh, make sure that, you know, everything is done the way you would want to do if you were still with us. What is one piece of advice you would give someone starting the estate planning process? Right. Okay. Yeah. The one piece of advice I would give is um, be, be shop wisely I mean, there are lots of people that you know uh, will you know tell you that they're going to do it for a cut rate price you're probably not getting a, a really well drafted document that's tailored to your individual needs so i would say you know be be choosy um be careful who you're working with and, and find someone who really does do, do this kind of work almost entirely or exclusively because that way you're going to have a much better experience you're going to get a much better document and you're going to get a much better plan that's implemented uh, to, for, to provide for you and your family and to protect you as well so um i'd probably steer away from someone who you know would also do your divorce and you know handle your dui i mean i would just work with somebody uh who really spends a lot of his or her time doing this kind of work so that they're really you know on top of what the law is and they can make the best recommendations to you uh, to design a plan that's going to work for you. You mentioned that earlier, Rod. What is that? What was that term that you use? Door something? A d- a door practice. Someone who has a door practice. So they have a, and I've seen these law firms. They've, right? oh, yeah. they've got this laundry list of services. Right. Yeah. And there's like two people in the law firm, and it's like, how could you be good at any one of those seventeen different things that you do? Exactly. Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah. And they just, they, you know, it's a, door, it's a door practice. Whatever walks at the door, that's what we do. Perfect. And then with that, I mean, if you niche down, Mm -hmm. how do you collaborate with other professionals like financial advisors, like accountants to help make sure that a a state plan is optimized to the best of its ability? Great question. Uh, I believe in a very collaborative approach. I mean, I don't have all the answers. I can't pretend to be uh, the, you know, to know it all. and, And I don't know it all. Um, and I also know, too, that if we've got the client's financial advisor and uh, maybe the tax and accounting professional, uh, I think it's going to be a much better plan because we're speaking to each other. We're collaborating together for the benefit of the client. If we're not doing that, we're missing an opportunity to bring some real value to bear. And I, you know, I, I, a lot of people talk it, very few do it, but I I. You know, I, I want to know who are your other advisors, and you know, I'm happy to, you know, share information with them. Of course, you know, assuming that they, you know, that the client agrees and consents to it. But I think it's a much better answer, and I think most most uh, uh, clients really like that. Uh, in fact, I just had a meeting with a client on, uh, last Friday, uh, and their financial advisor is actually back in Chicago, where they're from originally, and we did a family meeting where we walked um, the clients back through what we did for them. Uh, Their kids were there. Their adult children were in the room. So we helped them understand. I said, I'm not going to make you an expert, but I want you to understand what we've done and why and how this is going to play out someday when mom and dad are no longer here. And their financial advisor was on the Zoom call because we did a live meeting with the Zoom component. And um, the Zoom, uh, the the financial advisor in Chicago was very happy uh, that he'd been invited in and that he got to see what we'd done for the benefit of his clients. And I was thrilled to have his input too. So I think it's a much better result if we have a chance to collaborate for the benefit of the clients. What do you think is one of the driving 
I guess it's not the correct, correct way to answer that. What do you think is one of the inhibiting factors as to why more professionals don't work together on that collaborative effort like that? I think it's the way we're socialized. I think it's the way we're trained. Attorneys are very territorial. Financial advisors are very territorial, likewise CPAs. I'm not knocking any of that. I'm just yep. suggesting that, you know, it's the way we were trained in school and it's the way that we've always viewed each other with suspicion. And I think we've got to get past that and we've got to understand that sometimes the best uh, legal answers may not come from the attorney. They might come from the CPA. They might come from the financial advisor and, and vice versa. So I think we've got to get over ourselves and just realize, look, we're doing this for the benefit of our mutual client. And if we can get past our egos and get over ourselves, I think we can do a much better job for the clients that we're privileged to serve. I love it, Rob. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for being part of the National Refer Referral Network. We look forward to working with you on that side. For those of you that are watching, Rod's information is below. Please like and share this with people that you feel that could find value in this. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll make sure to get those to Rod. Um, but Rod, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being here. And if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.